All right, we are live again today on LinkedIn as well as PACT's YouTube channel. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we're going to talk about going from black box to white box, or basically going from unexplainable AI to explainable AI with Dennis Rothman, who is the author of this awesome book, Hands-On Explainable AI, or XAI as he refers to it, with Python. So uh, full disclosure, I'm about halfway through the book, and I've kind of been skipping around. But definitely some really great insights, highly recommended to anyone who wants to get you know some knowledge on explainable AI. There's plenty of Python code in there. And as Dennis told me, you can still get a lot if you ignore the code. So if you're not a Python coder, you can still get a lot of value from that session. So if you're joining us today, the first thing I'll let you know is you actually have a chance to win a, an actual copy of this book. So three people will receive a copy of this book. And the winners are actually selected by the best questions asked. So Pat, who is the publisher of this book, is going to select three names. They're watching during the session. And they're going to pick three names. They're going to send it to me about 20, 30 minutes into the session. So go ahead and ask your best questions for Dennis. Um, before I bring Dennis onto the stage, I do want to get a sense for where the audience sits with explainable AI um, or just trust in AI in general. Now, the scenario is as such. You are not feeling well, and you need to go to a doctor to understand what's wrong with you. And you have two options. One, you can go to a doctor, the traditional doctor, the white lab coat. You know, you go in, you sit down, and they check you and give you a diagnosis. And the other option is going to a full robotics AI um, facility that can also treat you and also give you a diagnosis. So let me know your thoughts in the comments. And while you do that, I'm going to bring Dennis Rothman onto the stage. Hello, Dennis. Hi, Kate. Here we are. Welcome to the show. Yes, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> so. Thanks for making me laugh a lot right before I kicked off. So uh, I had to compose mm -hmm. myself before going live. But yeah, trying to, keep a straight face. trying to keep a straight face. Yeah. So, well, I mean, happy is good too, right? So, yeah, happy is good too, especially nowadays. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, Dennis, let's start with an easy question. Tell us about yourself. Who is Dennis Rothman? Well, um, I'm Dennis Rothman. I was born in uh, Germany from a uh, Russian-American uh, Russian -American father and an Italian-American mother. So I'm coming from, and I, I live, I've been living in France for a long time. And so I'm a mixture of many cultures. So basically I started AI 35 plus years ago. I registered a word to vector patent and I've been doing artificial intelligence all my life in about every field, uh, computer vision, uh, voice recognition and working mainly with large corporations like airlines, aerospace. And recently I began to write books and become a speaker and share my thoughts. So here I am today. And if you want more, then you have my LinkedIn profile so that I don't put you to sleep in two minutes. So if you want more, it's on my LinkedIn profile. I doubt anyone will fall asleep during this session. Um, yes, that's all I'm going to say. So I don't want to, I don't want to warn the audience just yet. But where this conversation disclaimer, disclaimer, you will not fall asleep in this session. Yes, that's a guarantee. Well, I can't guarantee. I've been reading up a lot on um, guarantees. So I, I can assure you, you won't fall asleep. Um, so you mentioned you were doing work with large corporations. Talk a bit more about that. What kind of work are you doing there? Well, when I started out, maybe like uh, the real stuff like 30 years ago, artificial intelligence was in a winter. So I had to figure out how I was going to pay for my mortgage, my mm -hmm. debts, my car debts and all that because I was uh, I was younger. So the thing I found is to go to a corporation, uh, a major one like LVMH, the you know the or Lacoste, the crocodile people know okay. more of France or Disney or to someone and say, "Listen, I'll tell you what. I'm going to install a system and if you earn money, then you'll pay me." And if you don't earn any money, well, don't give me anything because it's worth nothing, okay? And I don't want to have legal problems. So I started out by asking for a percentage of what I earned for them, and that worked very well because then there was this trust that built up very quickly, and I was using explainable AI from the start so that the user would understand how it works, and I said, you have to understand how it works to accept it. So that's how I got into corporations, and okay. many of them, many, many corporations. 
All right, and then at this point, I want to just look at the comments. So uh, Ravit is here, and he thinks you're a rock star, Dennis. So that's good. I don't um, have my guitar today, but I can come with a. I have a piano. Okay, good. We'll do that at the end of the session. Uh, my niece is here, so she's actually getting into data. So good to see that Vita, you joined the the LinkedIn Live. Um, we've got Ayush is here saying hello. Uh, Vishal said. Venice last year is working on a similar AI based solution for healthcare with all kinds of diagnosis. Right? Interesting. Yeah, actually, I don't see any responses to my question, guys. AI or doctor? I mean, Dennis, well, I, I, know can I can answer it for you. Yeah, Dennis, what do you think? AI or doctor? Well, first, I'd like to say thank you to the people that know me and that connected to this live session. That's very nice and kind of them. So, if you have to make a, this kind of choice, well, you don't make the choice. Uh, if we're talking 10 years from now, you don't want to go see uh, a doctor that's not using artificial intelligence. And you don't want to go see artificial intelligence without a doctor, because uh, I believe in collaboratory uh, artificial intelligence, what I call cobots. You have a you have a human and a bot and it makes a, co a cobot. So I'd like to see a doctor that's just analyzing me as usual. And then you have maybe some sensors around and you have this program giving him ideas yeah. uh, that can help him because there are some complex things. Like uh, in the first chapter of my book, I did that. I, I, I worked with a doctor and I said, well, give me, a, well, give me a situation in which you can't find a solution alone. And we're talking about like end of uh, 2019, early 2020. So COVID wasn't really official. But you have to know there were fevers around already. And he said, I have this case where there's this guy has this fever. And I, I, I've never seen this. I don't know what it is. So we said, suppose you had his location with Google history. Suppose we found out the places he went to. And maybe we can find a, a virus somewhere. So we took this example of maybe you don't know about this, Kate. And I'm going to scare you for the rest of your life. It's called the West Nile virus. I just read that in the, in the book. It's Dennis. terrifying because it came with a mosquito, a little <laughs> mosquito that hit a bird, and the bird went over the Atlantic to New York, to where you live. I know. In, in the 1999-2000, and killed I don't know how many people. Yeah. And ever since, no one has found a solution. So every year in, in the United States, about 15,000 people die with that. With that. So in Ch I did this case where the person went to Chicago, and I found it with Google history. But then the person went back to France. So the doctor says, uh, we don't have any of this. My, where did you go to? So you can see that artificial intelligence can help the doctor. The yeah. doctor can help artificial intelligence become smarter. But I'd say for at least the next 10, 20, 25 years, don't answer the question. Ask for both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So one thing I'll let you know is I was reading actually with my niece in a park. With I was reading this book, and I remember telling her this. Um, we were in a park and it was what last week. So it was very hot and sunny. And it was a mosquito. <laughs> and mosquitoes eating me alive. And she's spraying me with alcohol or some other thing in the bottle, which is, I'm sorry, it was not working. And I'm reading about this deadly mosquito. I actually took a picture. I might post it because I was being bitten as I'm reading about these. And, deadly it's, in, and it's in New York every year too. <sighs> Perfect. So anyway, we've got some comments here. Avery says, AI never trust doctors. Okay. Dehan says doctor, hybrid doc with AI. We've got doctor. Some uh, prefer AI, a doctored AI, augmented intelligence. So, uh, yeah, Matthew says that the best AI is that which works with a human, not actually replaces them. So, a lot of people are agreeing with your point. Yeah, Matthew summed it up pretty good. You know, the best idea is that with which with a human not replaces them, of course. Yeah. For the moment, for the moment, maybe we'll, we'll we'll talk about this in 25, 50 years. But for the moment, let's be careful. Yes, yes, and Anne actually brings up the point about contact tracing and how AI can help. And you you get to that point where if you if everyone has their Google location tracker set on and brings their phone everywhere, then I guess that, that helps with the contact tracing, right? Right. That's so, right. So um, it, yeah. What if it outsmarts the doctor? Now that that is a real problem. Is it? Yes, because it happens. 
<laughs> so it's a real problem. That is a real problem. That, is, that, is, real yeah, problem. that question, that question is, is a tough one because, first of all, the artificial intelligence program can make a false positive, a false negative that will puzzle the doctor. Yeah. But then also, the doctor often makes false positives or false negatives too. Like you have a fever. Oh, well, go home and take some aspirin and come back in a few days if you have a problem, but then the person might be dead in, a, in three days. So, so a doctor can make a mistake. Maybe the artificial intelligence program can help him at that point say, be very, very careful because I have a, I have a high probability that you're facing something that can be you know, meningitis or something like that. So this can happen in some cases. So... We have to be very, I, but Matthew summed it up in the other users, uh, put them together and, and, and build trust with, ex, with explainable AI. So the doc, if the doctor, the doctor won't trust the software if he doesn't understand it. But mm -hmm. if you're explaining everything all along, the doctor is going to learn from the program and the program is going to learn from the doctor. So you, they have to talk and not just get answers, arbitrary answers. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's a question here from Tejas that was actually going to be the question I was going to pose to you. My question was broader in terms of can you define what is explainable AI to the audience for those that are not familiar with it? But Tejas is asking, does explainable AI mean interpreting the results from the model that can be explainable with domain experts? Okay, so explainable AI, let's put it in a nutshell. Suppose I say... Um, I like cake, okay? You take a sentence, I like cake. And in the sentence you say, let's simplify it. Uh, I is one, cake is two, and three is like, okay? And yeah. then you have, uh, I like chocolate, and then you have all these numbers, okay? So that's that's the beginning of artificial and an artificial intelligence program is that we convert everything into numbers. Mm -hmm. And we call them vectors. So, because we put all these numbers together so they make a pack of numbers. Then we say, well, there are too many numbers. So let's take it another level and let's just take some of the numbers we need to make a decision. Oh, that's good. Let's take another. And at one point you reach a, a, a series of numbers. You don't recognize anything. Like I like cake has become uh, 32,450. Uh, you don't understand anything anymore. And then all of a sudden it gives you a result. And yeah. it tells you uh, cake doesn't like cake. And you say, how did he reach a result like that when I said, I like cake, cake likes cake. And, and then he made this false, this false uh, negative saying, I don't like cake. But then remember, we have millions and millions of records. Yeah. So now you're saying, I don't trust that system anymore. Yeah. And it takes only one error to destroy the trust yeah. for a user. So then explainable AI say, okay, let's forget about the algorithm. So AI explainable AI is model agnostic. It doesn't care about the model. It's not interested in the model at all. In fact, the model can do anything it wants. Explainable AI is not interested. It's going to take the input. At one point, it said Kate, Kate liked cake and Kate liked something else. And the other side, it sees it's, it's, it's uh, negative. It's something's wrong. So now we have to explain that. So what we can do is look you know, that we're going to look at each word and we're going to try to take one word out, put it back in again, compare it to maybe another sentence where he got it right and see exactly what's wrong. And then we can say, oh, Kate likes Kate came out as false negative because in another sentence she says, I'm on a diet. Oh, so, so it, it will go and it will just look at your input, it will find words. With a lot of equations, it's just a different feel. It's not, it's a different feel. It's full of algorithms that are very different from artificial intelligence uh, per se, and it will give you uh, examples. Mm -hmm. Now, to give another one, which is probably easy to understand, we have to recognize a cat, okay? It's in uh, chapter 11 of the book. It's called With Anchors. So you have the picture of a nice little cat. I'll find it. And you you say, well, how that's how does it... important. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. Chapter 11, maybe, Anchors. Is that it? Yeah, that's the cat. You have the cat. So you say, how do I know that's a cat? I mean, that's not possible. How, how did he know it's a cat? So what we do is we take the image apart, 
and then we feed things, we, we look back into what's happening, and then we just find the eyes, the nose, and a little part of the mouth, and then we show it. So yeah. explainable AI is really pinpointing the exact feature that made the difference. Mm -hmm. But what if the mouth was covered? If the mouth is covered, it shouldn't answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. It shouldn't answer. I mean, if the mouth is covered, and uh, suppose you have the eyes and it can't find an answer, uh, normally we have what we call a threshold, which mm -hmm. means I say, I'm saying, listen, do you want to go to the movies? And you say, uh, well, maybe. I said, well, may if you say maybe, we're not going. It, mm -hmm. So so I say the threat, and you say, well, I don't want to go. That's a good threshold. Or say, I really want to go. So what you do is you put thresholds in there. Mm -hmm. Thing if it's not really a high probability and she, and you just say oh I might want to go I'd say well this forget it I'm not I'm not it, we're not going okay yeah. so you put a threshold in. Dennis, the, the movie theaters are closed so that's a move point <laughs> we don't have to worry about it okay but but in, in France they're open oh are they okay I didn't know all right we, we can go to the movies but I don't go to the movies because I'm scared of giving getting COVID okay I'm, I'm scared <laughs> All right, so scared man. Um, question here from Travis. Let's move this along. So, would you compare the use of AI in healthcare to the use of AI in self-driving cars? Often, both have been judged based on their failures versus their triumphs. Ooh. Ah, okay. So, Travis. First of all, we have to separate the two subjects because uh, self-driving with auto autopilots is something insane. I mean, have you drive, if you drive a car, you know that human beings are insane. So <laughs> when we're driving, we have millions of situations that no one can think of. You know, something, someone going crossing the street when he's not supposed to, drinking a soda, a guy with a bicycle uh, riding by with no hands on the bars, looking at streaming. So mm -hmm. there's, it's it's an open environment. It's what we call an open environment. So yeah. so many parameters come in there that's impossible. In fact, you don't know when you get up in the morning, you drive a car, if you're going to ever get to the place where you want it to be without getting a scratch, someone yelling at you, uh, someone breaking. What, okay. So self-driving car is an open place where you have features just coming in and coming in. Healthcare is different. Yeah. The researchers uh, do the research in a closed environment. Mm -hmm. They will take a panel of patients and they will take a panel of patients uh, not using AI they will use it with a certain number of features. They will close the situation, and then they will measure. They will measure the results uh, that we produce compared to the real results a doctor would give in a very closed environment. So that that's pretty easy. I mean, so can it really be a closed environment though? Because people tend to do things unpredictable things, like eating sixteen cheeseburgers with a pint of ice cream at the end, and that might impact results of experiment unless you're literally locking them up with okay so now suppose if your experience if your experiment is an open experiment yeah on weight on the weight of a person on a diet in a month then we're back into an open environment okay. we can always do. if you want to do that you have to put them in a clinic you have mm -hmm. to pay them for a month what researchers usually do and just eat what we give them okay and then we can see that if someone eats meat every day we'll see that person a eats the same thing as person B and strangely enough they're not they don't lose the same amount of weight in the month because then genetic factors come in or other factors mm -hmm. so uh, if Travis has a follow-up question uh, he can ask it or we can move on to whatever you want we have so many questions coming in from the audience it's honestly hard to choose so while I look for that why don't you tell people why you wrote the book what was your thinking behind writing it, what motivated you, how long did it take, tell, tell us that story. Okay, so um, PACT published Artificial Intelligence uh, by example, second edition, end of February, okay? okay? And I looked at the book and I was thinking, and I was talking to people around me and I saw that people honestly didn't understand artificial intelligence even though they worked in artificial intelligence, so. <laughs> And then there's this very bright person at PACT called Tushar Gupta. You, I don't know if you know him. Tushar Gupta is a visionary. He's a very young person, but he's a visionary uh, in the sense that 
he told me, I'm going to give you a list of books you can write because we're confined and all that. It's a lockdown. And I know that you're, you, you can get quickly bored and you want to do something. I'm sure you'll like explainable AI because it'll fit well with the other book where you're going to explain. And then I look, I'm always hesitant. So I looked into it and I say, yeah, that's a good idea because this way with this book, I'll be able to talk to people that don't understand the first book. So okay. if you put both books together, yeah. then you have it. You can learn the algorithms and then you can learn how to explain them. And there's a second factor is that the laws are changing very quickly, very, mm -hmm. very quickly in Europe. We have what we call the GRPD. GDPR, you, yes. GDPR, you have, you're, it's mandatory. If someone asks you to explain why an automatic system gave an answer, you give it, or it can cost you like three or 4% of your turnover and a 20 yeah. million euro fine. In the United States, in the United States today, discrimination is becoming a very, uh, very sensitive subject. And uh, there, are, there are laws in several states now banning information on uh, race and uh, gender. If you mm -hmm. take these two factors in the United States, you'll see that in Chapter 5 of my book, they, people give you uh, a data set to predict the income of someone based on race and gender. Mm -hmm. That drives me literally through the roof. I mean, uh, of course, if you – I mean – First of all, race doesn't exist because 20 years ago, someone people found the you know uh, genetic code. And it, it just skin is like a color, like uh, like the color of your hair. So you, you someone's blonde, uh, yeah, okay, he's black, brown. Who cares? Green, yellow. I, who, I mean, it makes no difference. I mean, people can even paint themselves in blue. I don't. I don't see the. I don't see what, how it's going to affect their way of thinking at all. So, and you can't judge someone like that. So. What explainable AI does is I took this database as it was given to me and I used this, I would say, biased data and I obtained a result. Then what I did is I just took it out. I said, I don't believe in race. I don't yeah. believe in these origins. I don't believe in gender. I don't believe that a woman that was married and divorced might learn. I don't care. I took education and age. Yeah. I took the number of years of education of a person and I took the person's age. And I found that someone between 30 and 50 with I'm going to with I'm going to take the, the, the top extreme with more than 12 years of college, 12 years of education, including in a field that's useful, is going to earn more than fifty thousand dollars a year in, in the U.S. So I, I, I literally proved in this chapter with explainable AI that if you take these fields out and then I show which one and you have a. Uh, what if you have Google that gives you uh, these nice tools to show it? Mm -hmm. You can improve your point. And then you can take the black box AI and turn it into white box because now you can find the bias and you can say that's where it is and it's that field and that decision. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. that's, so that got me worked up a bit. Yeah, I saw a video you did, I think a short YouTube video where you were explaining this very concept of removing a few of the columns that shouldn't be shouldn't be used um, and, and yeah, it, honestly it really I, you know i just i just get off the train at that point i'm mad when i see data in there because artificial intelligence is is data driven yeah. so if you put rotten eggs in your data you're going to get a, a rotten scrambled eggs at the end you're going to get an omelet that's going to it's not going to smell well so the first thing you want to do is go look at your data because in the middle you just have a pack of equations so I would, I would be very careful to look at data sets today because you can end up with a protest in front of your office in the United States and you can end up uh, with a 10 million euro fine in, in, in Europe. So yeah, you mentioned GDPR. yeah, you mentioned GDPR and there was actually a question here from Niraj um, under GDPR articles 13 and 14. Users need to be informed when AI-based automation systems are at work, as well as provided with any meaningful information regarding the logic used and the significance. So do you think this is practically happening? I, I think this is absolutely happening because I, if a person in my family works uh, is a lawyer yeah. and works in that field. And believe me, if you make a decision, if you're in a, you're, you're a bank, and you're using artificial intelligence, for example, like the New York Stock Exchange uh, uses, uses a lot of machine uh, learning and does yeah. automatic transactions. And you don't agree with that transaction. And you're saying, why did you sell all my shares? And the next day they went up 
and you go to that bank and they don't give you an explanation, no. you can, they, they can get fined for a million euros. And if you're like, uh, it's very serious here. If you, if someone uh, goes and finds racial information on you and says, oh, you're Arab, because in Fr the United States, the problems with the blacks in France, the problems with the Arabs. So you say, you're Arab. We found out that you were Arab. So you're probably not going to earn as much. Wow, wow, you're, you're in real trouble. He can go to the police. He can yeah. uh, file a suit and it will really go to the end of it. And, and, and the bank will be in big trouble anyway. So yes, it is happening and it's going to become tougher and tougher. In fact, Google, uh, it's in my book somewhere, got incredible fines for this. We're talking about hundred million dollars. Uh, oh, and wow. remember, uh, Facebook got a $5 billion fine for something like that, $5 billion. So who's so fine this happening. Is this GDPR or is this in the U.S.? No, no, no. The United States is becoming strict too. Did you notice that Zuckerberg is often in the U.S. Senate? No. <laughs> he's often in the hearings and well, they're asking him questions. And he he never knows the answers. You know, he's always this naive person, very nice. Oh yes, that. How did that information? I don't know. So, I think uh, this goes to a much deeper problem. It goes back to what we were speaking about before, but I won't speak about it, but I'll, 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 I'll make implications. It goes about that governments are, not, are weaker than social media. For example, Apple has a higher capitalization than the, G, uh, the, the gross national product of France. So mm -hmm. now we have these corporations that are more powerful than countries. Now, if you yeah. put them all together, you put Facebook, Google, Twitter, and you put all Microsoft, you put them together, they have this power, and I think it's becoming a little more powerful than governments. So the only way to stop them is the law, and the law is pretty strict nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know the CC, uh, California has the CCPA, and I read that New York is pending some regulations that are meant to be even stricter than GDPR and CCPA, but I know they're not final. Interesting to, to see now, where that is. I know California is a special case. You know, I come from New York, so I don't care about California. <laughs> California is a special case. Okay. Because California today has some of the has geniuses like Elon Musk, like uh, all these people. They're geniuses. They're, they're fantastic. Their, their state is burning down. They, they have a state that's burning down, literally, because of yeah. all these people. But they're sending people on the moon. Okay. Maybe they could send people uh, in the deserts and create, uh, you know, water with uh, humidity and con concentrate, you know, con condense humidity into water. Yeah. I think they could put that to good use, and for the tens of thousands of homeless uh, that are walking around. Yeah, I think it's all about priorities. Um, their personal priorities. The priorities go to the moon. Okay, fine, go to the moon. Yeah, I think that is his goal is to move everybody out of Earth. No, 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 no. That's not the goal. International we're inter. Talk, we're talking about let's do explainable. Let's do explainable uh, technology. The goal of going to the moon. Uh, you have uh, Jeff Bezos. You have Amazon. You have uh, you have uh, Musk. You have the NASA. Yeah. There's only one goal, and if you bear it in mind, you can see the logic is mining. If you come back with uh, Jeff Bezos is around, um, is, he's around $200 billion now. He's the richest man in modern history. But if he goes to the moon and he manages to mine helium-3 and other rare minerals, uh, he's going to be, it's, he's going to double his fortune. So they're, they're, they're selling us Mars knowing that, you know, it's not going to happen right now, but, but mining can happen. Hmm. And that, you can earn a lot of money. Maybe that money will help people back on Earth. Who knows? Maybe, maybe that's the goal all along. Sure, I'm sure that's what they're trying to do. So, then you asked for difficult questions, and I'm okay. going to give So, let's see. Andrew Jones from Data Science Infinity. So, if a customer asks OpenAI to explain a decision that GPT-3 makes, how did they realistically go about this with 175 billion parameters? That's so. a fantastic question. I, I love that question because I love uh, GPT-3. So, so, Andrew, first of all, you know that uh, my uh, OpenAI has not given us the, uh, the access to the source code. 
GP, you can download uh, GP2, GPT2 on uh, GitHub and you can run it perfectly, but you can't download GPT3 because they said it's too powerful and we had, they have to be careful. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you can't get your hands on it. Since you can't get your hands on it, you can't explain it. So let's go back to GPT2, okay? Because GPT3 is just scaling of GPT2. If you read the public, their, their articles, their papers, you'll see that GPT-3 is just a scaling of GPT-2. Now, to explain GPT-2, you have to know that they, this is probably the, one of the greatest innovations in artificial intelligence and in modern artificial intelligence. They have reached the point where they can do zero shot. That means that they will train the system. They will train the system so well that it can do natural language processing with no further training. That's where they are now. Mm -hmm. So to explain um, a transformer, because we're talking about transformers, to explain uh, a transformer, you have to, for the moment, for the moment, there is no algorithm that, like for explainable AI, that will do the job for you. You can understand the logic when you run several models. I've, I've run hundreds of them. So you can understand the logic. So what I, I the advice I can give you if you're, you've downloaded GP2, GPT2 and you're running it for summarization and sentence predictions, what I do is I, I train it. What I do is I train it on my data. I take their data out of the way and I mm -hmm. prepare a text, my text, which, which, which I know very well. I prepare my text or people I know or things I know, and then I'll run it. And when it runs, then I know exactly what it did because since I know my text by heart and I know everything that's inside of it, I know how it, it reached that logic. So now when I take another text that, that I don't know about and run it, then I understand how it works. But we are talking about uh, the most powerful uh, system ever, ever created. And when you're talking about 175 billion parameters, uh, what 170? Their models. I ran. Mo yeah, you can. Their, their models going over that right now. So uh, I think it's. Yeah, you have models that are. And the whole limit it was 340 m million. Then it reached one billion and a billion and a half. There are a lot of parameters. So what I would say for the moment, you have to understand the logic of it. And I'll be. Uh, I'll be. We're, I'll be publishing things on LinkedIn. Uh, in the next few weeks, and I'll be going deeper in the next few months. So I'll, I'll be publishing posts with code, with stuff like that, like I usually do. All my mm -hmm. posts are technical anyway. I don't go into hype. I just go into code. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have a very easy question here from Alfred. Is this being recorded? I'll take this one, Dennis. Yes, the session is being recorded. It'll stay on LinkedIn and on Pact YouTube, and then later today it will be on the Story by Data YouTube channel as well. And yeah, the and, and the CIA and the Russians are listening to it. They're all listening, yes. They're all listening to Kate and Dennis. Yes, exactly. Uh, question here from Mitchell Thompson. So would you consider a dissection of explainable AI in terms of levels or scope that are based on the complexity of the model or based on the comprehension level of the audience? If either, what would those levels of, or scope be? Functional um, application of human? Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent question because um, what, what, I'm, what I think is if you take my book and you take everything I did, you can see that you'll understand it. If you're, uh, if you're like Kate and uh, you know, you don't, you're not that much into coding, but you know data, like Kate, you're like a data scientist. And now if you're an artificial intelligence developer, that'll be super easy. Yeah. But let's take someone that doesn't know anything about computer science at all. Let's take that doctor, that doctor, you know, that to just gets this. I don't think, I think you have to have another layer of software. You have to, you can use the answer, but I think an, uh, a developer has to take the explanations given that mm -hmm. can, this, for, this could be for anybody. I mean, the answers are okay. They can reach any, any level. But you're going to have to transform them into a customized report of what they like to see. Maybe they want a header, they want a picture, maybe they want a little text on the right. You're going to have to customize it so it can be, you know, usable. It can't. You just can't take it and give it to a user. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I did that in, chap in chapter one. I did some of that where I developed, you know, these interfaces. I also used a, a chatbot in chapter seven, you know, to so that people can ask questions and get answers. So you can use a chatbot as well to say, did you really understand or you have questions? Uh, but remember, bu building a chatbot is a lot of work, but it can be done. It, OK, but it takes let's say it can be done. It takes work. Yes. Um, and since you mentioned code, I did have a question for you in terms of um, the book is Explainable AI with Python. Was there a reason why you chose Python over other languages here? Yeah, I often get that question. In fact, I have a person in Canada right now that's writing me every day on LinkedIn, every day, every sometimes twice a day and saying, Wait, why uh, isn't this in C++? And then giving me 100 reasons. I now, I'm a, I'm a C++ developer. Uh, originally, I developed most of what I did for corporations in C++. Yeah. But there's a big, the problem is right now that Python is the one, the, the language that's been with PyTorch, of course, and you have TensorFlow, Carousel, this, 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 this little environment, this ecosphere, this echo, it, it's Python. It's, you, you find those program, artificial and programs are in Python. People work in Python. The Google shares Python. Uh, the, the easiest thing to install is Python, Python right now or PyTorch with uh, Facebook. So it's just the easiest way to learn uh, artificial intelligence. Then if you want to use it, in, you can always convert what you did into C++ and use uh, specific processors or to do it. You know, like NVIDIA uh, sells these packages. You have these packages. So I'd say Python is the easiest language to do artificial intelligence in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Python is mainly listed as one of the most well, popular. Rank, what's rank one? It's rank one right now. Okay. Well, I guess it depends what you're looking at, right? Like what type of... Of course, if you're writing a website, maybe you want to use HTML, JavaScript, yeah. and uh, PHP. If you're mm -hmm. doing uh, industrial optimization, you want to use a C++, or you might want to use Java. And if you're doing artificial intelligence, uh, you're, you're trying to get everything working, then you do it Python. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I, I've developed in all the language I just said, and it, you're right. It just depends on the, the topic. Mm -hmm. um, question here from Kurt Broman. So AI is still in its infancy. How and whom should defend AI from manipulation that is already taking place? Manipulations that infringe upon our privacy as well as what we think. Corporations are using this to restrict speech and nation states use this to control citizens and influence politics. Uh, how can we ensure our privacy and speech are protected and how can AI be used to do so? Okay, Kurt, I have to tell you something because this is a conversation I have almost every day with my family and friends and they're always hitting me on the head with artificial intelligence. Okay, so Kurt, I'm going to give you an answer that I'm not, I'm not sure many people are going to like, but I'm going to give you the answer. So maybe, Kate, you can hide behind the screen while I give the answer. <laughs> so what I'm saying is human beings, uh, I'm sorry to say, yeah, hide your screen. I'm saying human beings have, have issues, right? Human beings are not very stable. You have these wars. You have these uh, riots where people you know, don't understand each other. And we think that's normal, but if you look at it, you can see that humans are psychologically unbalanced. I mean, the, the, who wants to go out in the street and kill people just for an idea? Maybe you want to do something peaceful like Martin Luther King or, you know, or who wants to rob people and become super billionaires and then have people sleeping in the street right next to them. So we humans have, we have issues. We're, we're, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not fantastic. So I would say, Humanity is not extraordinary. It's it's, uh, but but at the same time, I am uh, an expert in uh, de uh, deterministic chaos. I believe in chaos. I believe that the world is in chaos, with a lot of people saying something and the other people saying the opposite. But I I believe in uh, the chaos theory of a mathematician, French French mathematician, that says there's spontaneous order. There is always something good and something bad that's going to oppose each other. Let's take the situation in the United States right now. People are looking at it and they're saying, gee, what's happening? Well, it's like an earthquake that, you know, it was due, it was due. Like you have, it was due, it was due at that some point, these, these people are gonna be angry. So you're thinking, what, what's gonna happen? 
Well, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. A lot of good things are going to happen. First of all, it's going to stop at one point. This is not going to last 10 years. It's going to stop. And people are going to be, be, be careful. They're going to say, oh, well, yeah, well, there might be some discrimination there. We're going to be careful. So it's going to take this violence, the uh, people that don't agree. And at one point, there's going to be spontaneous order, like... Uh, Blacks can vote in 1950, but they can vote in 1964. Women uh, didn't vote until 1919. And then things become average. So what I'll say, human, always, human beings always reach an average level where they're not excellent and they're not bad. Now, let's apply this to your question. There's not privacy for the moment. Let's not kid each other. I'm speaking about all these laws, but every time you go on your app, there's a little there's a little thing say do you agree so every time you say I agree you're, you're going around the law again so just look at your applications on your smartphone you'll see everything they're reading images uh, contacts photos there is no privacy so but there's a limit to that because people might you know stop putting uh, secretive information on their smartphones it's there'll be there's a balance uh, and you're speaking about governments, maybe you're speaking about China. Okay, well then when China goes too far, you have people like in Hong Kong, or you have people that they get mad, or people in China are rich enough to go live somewhere else. So I believe, and I'm going to prove it to you, that human beings are not great, they're not bad, they're just average. And why is spontaneous order true in chaos? Look, at we're talking, we're not all dead. Think of what we did in the 20th century. We were killing people by 50 million people at a time. I mean, this was really mass murder. We're still alive. And you know what? The human population is at like 9 billion. If we were really bad people, there'd only be, you know, maybe one of us or two of us left or maybe three monkeys uh, and a dog. But, you know, we're average. And we always manage to find a solution, you know, to survive. So we're not that bad. So I'm saying there is no protection for the moment. But there'll be check and balances. There's nothing to worry about in the long term. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, just to stay on topic for a second, you mentioned the phone and the apps. And I wanted to get your thoughts on who do you think is responsible? Is it the businesses? Is it the government? Or is it the public's responsibility to basically, should we, the people, say, no, I don't accept all of those you know, um, breaks of my privacy and trust? Or is it the government that says, no, you can't have those blanket statements that have people agree, or is it the business that needs to, to control that? It's, it's much more simpler than everything you just said. I mean, you, can, you can simplify it. Uh, let's say you're in New York, and then you want to use Zoom on your smartphone. Okay, okay. so you take your little smartphone out, and you want to use Zoom on it, or you want to, and Zoom is what, or Skype is going to say, well, listen, you know, to do that, you have to agree that I can use your camera. Otherwise, I don't see how I'm going to take a picture. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now I have access to the camera. But you want to record. Okay, so you have access to the photos and the videos. Hey, say, do you want to invite people? But if you want to invite people, you need to type their name each time. You have to remember all the people. Or can we have access to your contacts? So just type the first letters. So we're the ones that are first driving this because we want all this technology. No one, you don't have to have this. You can take this and throw it in the garbage can but then everyone's going to be unhappy because every, this is the center of all our lives now. We, we live. This is our best friend, our family, sister, brother, the smartphone. If you take the smartphone away from of a person, you're going to feel like desperate. You took my smartphone. So we accept that. And on the other side, you have companies. Let's say you're, you're in a startup. Okay. You start. Okay. How do you know that these people like your application? So now these people download your application for free. How are you going to pay for your mortgage next month? I didn't pay. I just wrote this super cool application. I have 1 billion people that download it, and I respect privacy. How, do, how much do you earn? Zero. Yeah. Oh, well, then you're dumb. Why don't you put advertisements in it? Well, people don't like that. It invades their privacy. Well, then you'll go broke in two months. So then we put ads in it. And you say, well, I, so, and you're not, you're not earning enough. But someone says, you know, I can buy 100,000 of your contacts and I'll give you uh, $100,000. Okay, here it is. So <laughs> I have bills to pay. 
I have med medical care to pay. <clears throat> I just had COVID. They gave me a test for three thousand dollars, and in the hospital it cost me thirty thousand dollars just to spend a few days in there, and I don't know how to pay. Now I'm going to sell a few contacts. It's just spontaneous, spontaneous uh, disorder. Yeah. All right, moving on. So. <laughs> Uh, we're getting ready to wrap up, Dennis. I know we still have a, a bunch of questions we didn't get to. And maybe if you have time, those questions will still be available on LinkedIn if you want to go and continue conversations. But question here from a um, LinkedIn user who's taken an extra step to protect their privacy from uh, showing their name on StreamYard here. But yes. what is your take on the minimum level of foundational knowledge like math, stats, and logic to explain AI models? And is this also a consideration for your book audience? So who is who was this book written for? I would say for explainable AI, honestly, uh, you have to know at, at least what I wrote in the first book. I mean, you have to have basics in artificial intelligence uh, and know, you know, how to understand Python. And it's not for a beginner. Mm -hmm. I have to admit it's not for a beginner. I'd like to say, oh, it's for everyone. Buy the book. No, well, it isn't. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, I probably lost, you know, 95% of my sales, but you have to be honest at one point. So I'm, so I'm selling, you have to know at least, not mathematics, you don't have to worry about mathematics, but yeah. you, have to, you have to know how to use Python, how to download something from GitHub, in, install it, or open a Jupyter notebook. It, you need maybe a beginner knowledge, okay? Let's say it's for intermediate and advanced. Mm -hmm. okay. and you have to have suffered. Yeah. Suffering is part of it. It means that you've been working on artificial intelligence and you don't even understand what you're doing. You're suffering. Explainably, AI will help you. Thank you. So that was the last question from the audience. Now we're actually going to reveal the winners. I've got the three people who've asked the best question. And I will say that the questions and comments that have been coming in have been really, really great. So I do appreciate everybody for the engagement and the curiosity and the and the questions and comments. So Dennis, while I pull up my screen, maybe tell people where they can get the book if they fit the description of those who you think are the audience. Where would they go to actually buy the book? Where's the best place? Amazon. Amazon. That's easy. OK. <laughs> it's easy because it's in every country. Yeah, Amazon. I need you to scroll while I pull up the winners. And then for, people, for people that you know don't like Amazon, I want to say something. There are a lot of books that wouldn't be available uh, in, in in a bookshop if it weren't on Amazon. Yeah. So Nirji Sapel, Andrew Jones, and Kurt Broman. Okay. Here are, yep, Andrew Jones and Kurt Broman. Congratulations! You will be mailed an actual physical copy of Dennis Rothman's book. Um, thank you so much for asking. Great questions. And oh, let me just do this. The other questions were good too. You know. Yes, I know. I know. It was so hard to pick, though. That's why I had Pat help out with that. That's it, right. We, we don't have to do that. We, we asked Pat to do that. Yes, yes. As more questions came in, the um, the top three kept changing around. So we finally had to uh, land on these three. But Dennis, I, I want to thank you so much for your time. Where can people continue the conversation if they, LinkedIn. you know, have questions? LinkedIn. People LinkedIn. have connections with me can just, you know, ask me questions that... People that know me know I answer them all the time, so no problem on LinkedIn. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And actually, before we wrap up, for those who are still hanging around, I just wanted to announce that PAC Publishing is actually a community sponsor for the dedicated conference. So if you wanted to sign up, it's a free event hosted uh, in a very similar fashion here on LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn Live. So you could go to storybydata.com slash dedicated conference to sign up. And on that note, Dennis, thank you uh, so much okay. again doing this and have a great rest of your day. Okay, you too, Kate. Bye-bye.